Hello, I'm Bill Carmody, and my guest today is Ron Friedman, a psychologist and behavior change expert who specializes in human motivation. He's a frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review, CNN, Fast Company, and Psychology Today, as well as the author of the best-selling book, The Best Places to Work. His latest book, Decoding Greatness, How the Best in the World Reverse Engineer Success, is what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome, Ron. Thanks so much for being here today. I loved your latest book, Decoding Greatness. I'm excited to talk to you about it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. So let's kick this off. Before reading your book, Decoding Greatness, I mistakenly associated reverse engineering with blatantly copying someone else's work. But in your book, you clearly dispel this myth. Would you kick us off today by talking about what decoding greatness is really about? Yes, that's a great question. And a hard hitting question right out of the gate, Bill. So I appreciate that. So um, the big idea behind this book is that the main stories that we've been taught about success are wrong. So there are two primary stories that most of us have heard throughout our lives. The first story is that greatness comes from talent, the idea that we're all born with certain inner strengths and that the key to finding your greatness is to find a field that allows those strengths to shine. The second story is that greatness comes from practice. This is the Ma Malcolm Gladwell story of 10,000 hours. If you just find the right practice regimen, you uh, show enough effort and discipline, eventually you will get to the top. But there's a third story about greatness, and it's one that people don't often talk about, yet it is the path by which so many uh, entrepreneurs and marketers and inventors have gotten to the top of their field, and that process is reverse engineering. And that simply means finding examples that are the best in your field and then working backward to figure out how they did it, how they succeeded. It's the path by which people like Malcolm Gladwell learned to write, and Stephen King's another example. Uh, Monet Cezanne, that's how they learned to paint. Judd Apatow, I have a story in the book about how he became the comedy legend that he is that we know today uh, through deconstructing the work of other comedians. So it's not about copying somebody else's formula. It is about using a specific set of tools, which is what I talk about in Decoding Greatness, for better understanding what makes those examples so impactful, and then applying those learnings to create something that is novel and unique for yourself. You know, and what I love about that explanation is it's how you are both talking and, and, and modeling experts while putting your own creative ingenuity in behind it. And to me, that was the key insight was it's not just about seeing and modeling the 10,000 hours or, or the work that Malcolm Gladwell was talking about as well. It's about how are you actually putting your own creative spin on it. Exactly. Um, and, yeah, and, and a great example of this is uh, I talk about Twilight and how when Twilight came out, there were all of these copycat books about teenagers in love with vampires and all of them failed. And it wasn't because the books were necessarily bad, but because audience expectations have shifted. So if all you're doing is copying somebody else's formula, you're going to be viewed as derivative because audiences are not going to be impressed because you're not talking to the audience that that original author was talking to. They are now different. And so um, that's one one uh, uh, one limitation to copying somebody else's formula. The other limitation is that chances are you're not going to be able to reproduce their formula just as well as they did. And so it really is about leveraging some of your innate strengths, but use, utilizing the formulas that have succeeded in the past to get a better roadmap for how you can approach your work. Excellent. And and what I love about the uh, chapter you had on how to talk to experts, I reread that in preparation for this interview. <laughs> oh, and no. I wanted to talk to you about your journey, <laughs> your process of discovery. So in order to become a best-selling author, what resource was most valuable to you? I should have anticipated in retrospect, somebody pushing my questions on me. But they're great uh, questions. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> so what you, you want to know what resources I use to become uh, a successful author. Um, yeah. So, so a lot of entrepreneurs are like yeah. thinking about writing books or have written books. And there's a distinction between getting published and then creating a best-selling book. And okay. so one of the things that I'm interested in is if you sort of looking back, was there a particular resource that was most valuable to you in order to become a best-selling author? So I would not, so first of all, the use of the word best-selling author, I would just say like, let's not ever um, conflate quality writing with commercial success because those two things are not the same thing. You're the top 10 on, on, on Amazon or, or New York Times and I, I'm not convinced those are the 10 best books at any one time. That, 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 that said, um, 
I used my process to get where I am today. And here's what I mean by that is I'm a big believer in practicing what you preach. And so how I learned, how I learned to write my first book proposal is I asked a best-selling author, Sonia Lubomirsky, the, who wrote The How of Happiness to share with me her proposal. Mm -hmm. And I took that proposal and I reverse engineered it to figure out what was happening in each section. And then I used that to create a template of what I needed to put in my proposal. And so did I copy her proposal? No, but I figured out what was working and I applied it to myself to create something completely different. And that's how I got my first book deal in terms of, uh, and then uh, there's something important here, which is that the first step to becoming great at anything, particularly in a creative field, or if you're a marketer is to start a collection. And mm. what I mean by that is, um, you know, when we think about collections, we think about physical objects, we think about stamps or books or wines, but that definition is far too narrow. Copywriters, good copywriters will collect headlines. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, um, marketers who are good at their job will collect, uh, designers will collect logos or uh, landing pages. Th that collection enables you to go in there and then look to see what is working and what's different between these examples and non-exemplary examples, right? So the, comparing the ordinary against the extraordinary to see what's different. And by doing that consistently, you can't help but identify the ingredients that make something impactful. Um, now, as a writer myself, I have a ton of collections. I have a collection of impactful words, words that really got me to sit up and pay attention. I collect uh, opening sentences. Nothing I love better than an opening sentence. The first, the, the, oh, I love reading opening sentences of books. Even I have no intention of reading that book. I can tell so much about a book by its opening sentence. I will collect transitions. I collect conclusions. And what I'm, what I'm doing when I, it's something, you know, I, it's about having that material accessible to you so that when it's time for you to create, you have inspiration at your fingertips and you're not just staring at a blank page. So before we move on for that one, I'm really curious when you are reading that opening line, what specifically are you looking for? Complexity, emotion, mm. um, memorability. Is it unique? Is it, I, you can, Let's pick, do you have a second one? Yeah, you know, I love it. Book. All right, we'll do a little analysis. So here's Contagious. This is a book that I think- Yeah, jo people. Jonah Berger, I love him. Jonah Berger, he's a good writer. He's a great writer, in fact. Um, and let's compare him to Malcolm Gladwell. All right, great. so he's got Blink, blink against Perfect. Contagious. All right, so here's Contagious's opening line. By the time Howard Wine moved to Philadelphia in March 2004, he already had lots of experience in the hospitality industry. So you dive diving right in. I, I, I've got a story. Uh, there, there's specificity in, in Philadelphia and the date. Uh, you want to know what happens next to Howard Wine. Yeah. I, I don't see the emotion just yet yeah. in, in that sentence, but I do see some specificity. He's about, he's getting, he's winding up for a story. In September, okay, this is Gladwell. In September of 1983, an art dealer by the name of Gianfranco Bikini, Bikina approached the P. J. Paul Getty Museum in California. The word "approached" there, something's happening. He's yeah. about to murder someone. Like, I, <laughs> like I, I want to know what happened. So that the word that approached. So what I might do is I might take that word. And I would think about how would I have written that if I wasn't Malcolm Gladwell? Mm. And I would have probably chosen a far less sexy word, which is, would have been like went or went probably. I, so what I try to do is I'll do the reverse. I'll, I'll use, I'll find a good word and I'll think about the word that's more accessible to me. So for me, it would be went. So I will have a diction. I have a list of words that I would use and the better word. So went it would now become approached. And now I've got, I've figured out what are the words doing and how do I translate stupid Ron into Malcolm Gladwell? <laughs> I love it. That's fantastic. So I just continuing this journey, because I'm fascinated by this. When you are in writer mode, what is your daily process? I do not look at email in the morning and I will listen to an audio book of a writer whose style I am trying to learn from or channel on the way to work. And I work off an outline. Uh, I don't understand people who don't. Uh, outlining, uh, you know, uh, is a crucial part of my process, and um, I know what I'm going to write. I don't have to figure it out because I have figured it out before. This is where writers get stuck, and it's a very dangerous place to be. Is they don't know what they want to say next, which is why you have to outline. You got to iron that out right at the beginning, and now I'm able to channel the audiobook 
it, I know what's going to happen next and I just, I just do it. That's awesome. I love it. And the last one that I want to ask you again, I'm, I'm parroting back some of these expert questions because I think you're giving me exactly the jewels I was looking for. So thank you so much for humoring me and allowing me to ask sure. you the questions you pose in your own book. Oh, these my are fantastic ask- questions. They are. They're looking. great questions. That's why I love them. <laughs> so my personal favorite question from your book that I'd like to ask you directly is what factors turned out to be crucial to the success that you were not expecting? In terms of which part specifically? Yeah. So in the writing of this book, like um, this book right now, you could talk about this one. It's just launching, right? So this is, comes out on June 15th and we're going to talk about that at the very end. But yeah. this last one, Best Places to Work, what I'm interested in that particular book is what was a crucial factor to your success that you weren't expecting when you were writing it? That getting people to want to read your book is different than having written a good book. And those are two different processes. And this is so relevant for marketing because having a great product is useless unless you have strong marketing. So the marketing needs to be as strong, if not stronger than the actual product. And so, you you know, uh, part of it, you know, there were, I had some bad experiences with hiring PR firms that uh, couldn't deliver what they promised that they could deliver. And if I, and then I, you know, I made some changes and I, I like to joke that if I had just stuck with the first PR firm, or if I hadn't hired a PR firm, I could have just taken the, the book and flush it down the toilet. It would have the same impact on the world. And so strong marketing is as important, if not more important than the actual product. That's what I learned. That's great. So just in terms of just drilling one step, one level deeper, yep. what aspect of that marketing specifically was the thing that turned out to be a really critical success factor for you? Uh, the content that I created and placed in, in uh, places like HBR and CNN. And so basically you have to think of it as writing two books. You have to write the book that is the actual book and then the book that gets distributed. And unless you're doing that, it's going to be very hard to move books because asking people to read books is, is a tough sell. It's like, hey, 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 I've got this thing here that is going to require you to spend seven hours by yourself and you have to give me $28 to do it. It's like, that's a hard sell. It's a very hard sell. That's beautiful. So these are such powerful questions. How did you end up coming up with these questions of how to talk to experts? Uh, I, you know, I ta- there's a section in the book about how m- moderators get people to open up quickly. And I used to be a moderator. Mm-hmm. And so I basically took my best questions as a moderator and I grouped them out into specific ways that you might be able to apply them to get experts to open up. And so that there's your answer is, is the experience as a moderator and, and also the experience of coaching people. I love it. So I, I love it. I love coaching. I love the idea of facilitating and moderating. And all these are very powerful questions. And I think they're fantastic. So one of the things is I always take action on great advice. And so one of the things that I learned, there's many things I learned in your book, and I really love it, totally support it. But one of the things that was really powerful for me was the five-year journal. I went out yeah. and bought a five-year journal and immediately started using it. And I have not stopped since. And so my commitment is to actually go into and, and finish this five-year journal and use every every single line that's in it. So tell me, what is special about a five-year journal and why are you recommending that everyone has I'm so project? thrilled that you got one. And I, I, what, what I'm so glad for you is because you're going to find this completely transformative. So the five-year journal is like a, basically having a diary, except it, it requires very little of you because there's only space for you to write about three lines about what you did that day. It could be what you did that day. It could be what you learned that day. It could be um, progress on a particular skill. And you do this for a year and then something magical happens a year later, which is you get to see what you did on that day one year prior. And if you do it for five years, you have five years of information. And it's a process that doesn't just force you to reflect on what you learned that day, which is something we very rarely do. We're so um, wired up trying to get to the next email or the next meeting that we often don't take the time to reflect. And in that reflection, what happens is you get to consider your progress. Are things going in the right direction? Are you making the right choices? And it, it, this is a process that we're talking, since it's only three lines, we're, we're talking about like two minutes a day. And the other thing that is really powerful about it is in reviewing what you did the previous year and the previous years, you strengthen your memory for past events and you identify new learnings and insights about yourself. And I give examples about things that I've learned. Like for example, going to social events is not something I'm happy to do, but then I always end up enjoying them. And if I don't exercise and do cardio, I'm probably not going to sleep as well as I otherwise would. So it is just a great resource and an investment in yourself and and better understanding yourself and better uh, identifying the drivers of your success. 
Love it. I can't wait. And I'm really excited because I've really started and stopped journaling several times throughout my life. And I, this is the first time that I've stuck with it. And it's, you know, any habit can be developed after about what, 30 days to, to, to 45 days. So I'm already in the, the, the window now. So I'm I'll tell you why I tell you why I think it's so good, because I think that when we journal, we are assuming that the, the benefits are in that moment. And so um, here you're getting two doses of, of positive reinforcement, both in the writing, which is sometimes useful, but it's the reviewing that is like, for, so for, for me, often I'll write down something funny my kids did. And in reviewing that now, like my, my, my daughter's a teenager, nothing she does is funny anymore. So now, you know, I get to be reminded of that. So there's, it's just, a, it strengthens relationship. And if you have a, a partner who does it, you can compare what you both remember on that day. And it's just a great way to have a conversation about you know, past successes and also overblown fears. That's the other thing. So many things that happen in our day, we're like, oh man, I, I'm, how am I going to navigate this? And you have that journal to remind you of things you've done well in the past, it builds your confidence. Yeah. Well, not only does it build your com confidence, but actually builds towards mastery, right? Which is the next thing I wanted to shift to talk, talk to you about. So I am a fourth degree uh, black belt in Subak Do Muda Kwan. I am actually moving to fifth degree this year. And so I've had the experience and been studying mastery for quite some time. Like, what does it take to be a master? And one of the things that you share in your book is that mastery begins with metrics. Why is that? So in the book, I talk about something I call the scoreboard principle. And the scoreboard principle simply states that measurement begets improvement. Anything that you want to improve on, if you have metrics for guiding you to determine how well you're doing at that objective, you will improve. And if there are evolutionary reasons for why we're obsessed with numbers. This is why, um, you know, uh, so, so many people become obsessed with their Facebook account or their Twitter account or their linked followers. Those are what I would describe as vanity metrics, things that don't actually drive you towards your goal, but actually um, are still addicting to you because of the number element. And this is why apps have numbers uh, that, that try to reinforce your purchasing of new apps, uh, addition, additional uh, in-app purchases or uh, getting you to invest more time. And the evolutionary reason is if you didn't pay attention to numbers in the past, you didn't, uh, you weren't careful enough in guarding your resources. You didn't invest in selecting uh, effort in, in finding the largest food sources. You didn't steer clear of tribes that were menacing or try to ally with them. And so if you weren't paying attention to numbers, you weren't, you're not here. And so we can channel that in a, in a positive way by identifying the objectives that we're trying to improve, taking some time to work backwards and say, <laughs> if I want to be successful at whatever the objective is, getting a book deal, signing clients, what are the metrics that I need to hit on in order to be successful? And just simply narrowing down your focus on those metrics will lead you to improve. Excellent. So let's take the opposite of success. So let's go the other way for a moment, because in your chapter on how to take the risk out of risk taking, you acknowledge that successful businesses know the importance of failure. Why is it that most companies in the workplace, it's so unforgiving and often there are no opportunities to practice? At the modern workplace, uh, there is um, a very interesting dichotomy where the business as a whole takes lots of risk on research and new products and all of these in, on marketing ventures that may or may not pay off. But when it comes to individual employees, that same um, those same opportunities often don't exist. And it's because there's an attitude that every day is game day. There's no opportunity for practice. And if there are, if you fail at different elements of your job, then you need to be replaced. And there's also the concern on the part of employees, a very understandable concern that if they take a risk and that risk doesn't pay off, then they will be laid off. Yes. And so the key takeaway here, and this is actually going back to my first book, The Best Place to Work, is that we actually lead to greater learning and greater retention on employees when we allow them to take risks because that's how skill building happens. It's by doing something that lies just beyond your current abilities and then utilizing the feedback you get on your performance to understand how you can do it better the next time. We don't learn without taking risks unless we have organizations encouraging people to take more risks. They're A, not gonna learn and B, not be as fully engaged as they otherwise might be. 
And so staying in that, there's both the internal side of the risk taking with the employees, and then there's the actual businesses themselves. So one of the things, one of my favorite stories, you have a lot of great stories in this book. One of my favorite stories is actually about the Rolling Stones holding practice concerts as the cockroaches. That's the name of their band name, right? Uh, And what's the genius of establishing different brand name to test and learn? Yeah, so the, the example of the Rolling Stones, they're working under a pseudonym. And working under a pseudonym allows them to do something imperfectly and also gather feedback on their performance and they can improve when they're ready. And this is what businesses do all the time with sub-branding. In in the form, you know, the example I give in the book is The Gap. The Gap has obviously uh, Banana Republic and Athleta and um, some others that I'm not remembering right now. But the point is, is that they are using sub-branding because it allows them to try different things. Now, those are the, just the examples that I remember, but there are plenty of other sub-brands that the Gap had that they then later dismissed when they weren't working. And so what's really cru- critical here is to realize that you, if you have the uh, access to, to a pseudonym or a sub-brand, you can try things that you might not feel comfortable doing right now. And if it works out, that's great. You can merge it into your existing brand or just go off with a separate brand. But it is a strategy that I think gives people the confidence to try new things in their business without feeling they're putting everything on the line. And as we all know, the more risks you take, the more successful you're going to be. And if you're just playing it safe, you're just not going to get to create a dominant brand um, any other way unless you're taking those risks. Well, and, and sort of playing with that just a little bit further, uh, the other thing that I love that you shared was the uh, sub-brands on Amazon. So for That's example, right. if I want to try on some e-commerce components and I'm concerned about sort of uh, taking market share away from myself, using my, using a separate sub-brand in Amazon lets me contain whatever test or risk that I'm taking without damaging my brand or having any type of market disruption. So and I really thought that was a great strategy that people could use. Yeah, I appreciate you pointing that out. And you can play with price points. So if you're concerned with, wait a second, if I sell something on Amazon for $20, but I sell it in the store at $50, then my customers are going to be upset with me. You don't have to do that if you're working under a pseudonym and you can do whatever you want on Amazon and still uh, develop that e-commerce method of growing your business uh, as as a revenue stream without having to cannibalize your existing business. That's excellent. So as we wrap up our time today, I'd love to ask if there's anything I didn't ask you that I should have in order to give people a sense of what your book is really about. I think you've asked some great questions. What I will say that I think people have really um, found fascinating about the book is that there are some very practical strategies for decoding and reverse engineering TED Talks and websites and all of these uh, examples that we surround ourselves with. So it's, as I mentioned, the first step is to start a collection, but the second step is to break down what's working in that collection. And there are all kinds of tools that you can use and they're all in the book. There are things like reverse outlining and um, pr- putting some numbers to some of the features that are, uh, that are happening in your example to better identify what's unique from this example than others. And so it's all about having a set of methodologies and tools that you can turn to when you're trying to differentiate the ordinary from the extraordinary to better identify what are the key ingredients that make it successful. Oh, I guess I, Ron, I really, really wish that I had this book, your book, Decoding Greatness, before I did my first TED Talk. It was fantastic <laughs> to be able to actually go through and decode exactly what the most successful TED Talk had with all the elements. And even though I would have done it in, differently in terms of the things that I that I learned from it, it was such a fabulous way to deconstruct what's already been successful so that we can go through it. So Ron, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you sharing all your wisdom in this book, Decoding Greatness, out on June 15th, which is uh, coming up on, on Tuesday, June 15th. And uh, and I really recommend that anyone go out there, get grab it and take this stuff and don't just read it, but put it to good work. It's not about the great ideas. It's about what you can do with them that will help you actually change the outcome of your business. All right, Bill. Great questions. Thank you so much, Ron. Thanks for being here today. Appreciate My you. Pleasure.